If you want to practice all of the new PTE questions using artificial intelligence on an online portal that has a similar marking to your real PTE exam, head over to masterpte.com.au to create a free account. Here, you can practice all four sections separately and receive instant feedback for all of your speaking, writing, reading, and listening. You can also view and compare your answers with others who have already succeeded in achieving a high score. Download 9090 Band's template for speaking, writing, and listening. Take mock test, receive instant result, overall feedback, and in-depth analysis which helps you pinpoint exactly where you lose points. MasterPTE.com.au the best PTE practice software in the world. 10 years ago, before the use of iPhone or iPad, people's attention interval is about 25 minutes. This number is good. However, nowadays the attention interval has dropped from 25 minutes to only 8 seconds, which means our memories are shorter than that of a goldfish. What I've decided to provide is the steps I take when analyzing my own questionnaires. However, before I begin, it would be useful to remind you of a few terms we use when taking questionnaires. 
Questions can be divided into three types. This is sometimes called level me measurement. Firstly, we have a category type questions, which are also known as nominal questions. These are when participants select from a list of categories for their response, such as male or female, or they may include ethnic origin. Secondly, we have ordinal type questions. These are similar to category questions, but instead of the categories being independent, there is some sort of order between them. If we ask people to indicate their age in categories, this is an ordinal type question. Thirdly, we have continuous questions. These are any questions that can be answered by a number. It could be an open-ended question asking participants to tell you how many times they attended lectures or how often they used a VLE, or it could involve asking them to rate the importance of intensity of some experience. The Silk Road is not like what we thought it would be. People traveled in groups to other countries through the Silk Road, exchanged things, and then came back. There were also some side groups who went to other countries such as India, which was called the Amber Route. At that time, there was also gift changing happened on the Silk Road.
1943, what became known as the Green Revolution began when Mexico, unable to feed its growing population, shouted for help. Within a few years, the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations founded the International Rice Research Institute in Asia, and by 1962, a new strain of rice called IR8 was feeding people all over the world. IR8 was the first really big modified crop to make a real impact on world hunger. In 1962, the technology did not yet exist to directly manipulate the genes of plants, and so IR8 was created by carefully crossing existing varieties, selecting the best from each generation, further modifying them, and finally finding the best. Here is the power of modified crops. IR8, with no fertilizer, straight out of the box, produced five times the yield of traditional rice varieties. In optimal conditions with nitrogen, it produced ten times the yield of traditional varieties. By 1980, IR36 resisted pests and grew fast enough to allow two crops a year instead of just one, doubling the yield. And by 1990, using more advanced genetic manipulation techniques, IR72 was outperforming even IR36. The Green Revolution saw worldwide crop yields explode from 1960 through 2000.
Today we will talk about Australia's export business towards China, Japan, US. In the past, Australia was concerned about its geographical location, which may result in Australia being isolated from North America, UK, and later America. Nevertheless, nowadays with the rise of Asian countries, especially China, Australia has become a great export country with a perfect location. Currently, Japan is the largest exporting country to Australia, but China may become the largest one in the future. Australia should take the advantage of China's rise to develop its exports. The first thing I want to argue is that former civilization is running into pretty profound crisis in its relationship to the rest of nature, which we do and what we have depended on for survival and for flourishing. And this is the most widely and well-recognized relation to climate change, CO2 emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. But I want to argue the certain dangers in the way that has been presented as the central question that we have to address. Because it's interlocked with a number of other crises, that is most notably as the crisis in the access to fresh water, crisis in access to food, biodiversity loss on a huge scale, and associated problems of human and equality, not just in the common world, but actually in the kinds of environmental resources and pleasures that I can enjoy. 
So all, t all those together have to be looked at as interconnected set of really deep, profound crises. Today's lecture is about a loggerhead turtle, one of the largest turtles in the world, and almost distinct in the USA. They have big heads and short necks. In September, 1986, scientists put a tracker on a turtle's shell, and use satellites to track and locate the migration route of the turtle. They reach different localities in different time. The migration takes three months, from the South Florida to the North.
Today we will discuss the relationship between the fault lines in the Earth's crust and an earthquake. This dislocation of the rock occurs from the Earth's surface, seven kilometers to several hundred kilometers vertically down to the crust. The earthquake's focus is called the epicenter, which is vertically beneath the interior of the Earth's crust, and the energy releases and transfers through epicenter. The faults are the fracture on the Earth's crust. The position of the epicenters can be identified by the fault's map, looking down from the center of the Earth. It will result in seismic wave, which is dis decreased as it moved away from the epicenter. Uh, what we're going to discuss today is how the, the Port of London was discovered and what we discovered about it. Now, um, if you look at the historical records of Roman London, there's only about 14 actual references to London in antiquity, i.e. contemporary references, and of those, uh, only one is in the first century, uh, there are none at all in the 2nd or 3rd century. There's only one in the late 3rd century, and there's four in the 4th century. So if you're a historian trying to write a history of, of Roman London, it's very difficult. You don't really have much data. You're going to depend on the archaeological evidence, the material evidence, 
uh, of the port and indeed the town to have any understanding of what happened then. And so what we're looking at here is how did we discover about the Port of London? There is no historical documentations, no um, customs books, no tariffs, no idea of the taxes. We have to understand the port entirely from the archaeological evidence. So that's what we're going to do today. So if we move on to the next slide. I love live streaming. So <laughs> thank you very much. Now, the economists calculated it's a back-of-the-envelope calculation that removing all immigration controls would double the size of the world economy, and even a small relaxation of immigration controls would lead to disproportionately big gains. Now, for an ethical point of view, it's hard to argue against a policy that will do so much to help people that are much poorer than ourselves. The famous RAND study reckons that a typical immigrant who arrives in U.S. ends up with 20000 a year. That's rough. It's not just the migrants themselves who gain, it's the countries they come from. Already, the migrants working for poor countries, working in rich countries, send home around $200 billion a year. Through formal channels, and about twice as that through informal channels. 
and that compares to the $100 million that Western governments give in aid. These remittances are not wasted on weapons or siphoned off into Swiss bank accounts. They go straight into the pockets of local people. They pay for food, clean water, and medicines. They help kids in school, and they help start up new business. Sample answer? Removing immigration control would double the world economy. This policy will do so much to help poor people. Immigrants end up with 20000 a year from gains in countries they come from. They send home around $200 billion a year through formal channels, which are twice as that through informal channels. These remittances can help local people for living straightly.
if you want to practice all of the new PTE questions using artificial intelligence on an online portal that has a similar marking to your real PTE exam, head over to masterpte.com.au to create a free account. Here, you can practice all four sections separately and receive instant feedback for all of your speaking, writing, reading, and listening. You can also view and compare your answers with others who have already succeeded in achieving a high score. Download 9090 Band's template for speaking, writing, and listening. Take mock test, receive instant result, overall feedback, and in-depth analysis which helps you pinpoint exactly where you lose points. MasterPTE.com.au the best PTE practice software in the world.